like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ the Lord became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We pray you of your mercy, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, look graciously, we pray, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this is a reading from the Gospel according to John chapter 19, verses 16 to 42. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but... This man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. 
none of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who at first had come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb, which no one had ever been laid in. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, about 20 years ago, I was asked to take part in a dramatic reading of St. John's Passion for the Good Friday service at my home parish. As I was the youngest member of the cast by at least three decades, it was decided that I should have the role of Jesus. Now, none of us involved in this dramatic presentation had done any serious acting, but we were asked to do our very best to make this a truly dramatic reading. The director of this whole affair, who had no prior experience in stage direction, I might add, was the curate of the parish, who said that he was tired of hearing the passion read each year as one might read the instruction booklet to install a new dishwasher. He wanted us to really give it a go. And I was game, we all were. I remember in particular the man who played Pilot had a beautiful, deep, rich baritone. If I think about it, I can still hear him intone, what is truth? But I'm afraid that among this small cast of amateur thespians, I was least likely to be awarded any accolades for my performance. Now, it wasn't a sense of awkwardness about the role, as it might be for some. I've never been especially prone to stage fright, as you might guess. No, I was honored, and I wanted to do a good job. But every time I had a, a line, every time I was asked to give voice to Jesus' words as the evangelist recorded them, even I could tell that they were coming out a bit flat. Despite the best efforts and encouragement of our director and my fellow players, as we finished our rehearsal, I had the sense that they were all wishing they hadn't given the kid the most important role. And a day or two later, when it came time for the service, I really wish I could say I gave a stellar performance, but I know that my part was still a bit colorless, nothing resembling the florid drama the director wanted. Now, surely a more talented actor, an actor, not just the kid who helped run the youth group, could have done what I failed to do, given the performance that the curate turned impresario had in mind. So my fault, fine. But some years later, as I studied the passion narratives in a New Testament course, it came to my attention that if you look at the passion accounts in the gospels, carefully, that none of the Gospels is exactly the same. Each author puts different emphasis here or there. Each has a slightly different outlook. This is not to say that the accounts are contradictory, no, but they're like pictures of the same event taken from multiple angles. And of all four of these accounts, the one that we hear on Good Friday each year, the one in which I was meant to really give it all to dramatize Jesus' suffering, St. John's Passion presents Jesus from an angle that has him looking and sounding remarkably serene. In Mark's Gospel, for instance, the Passion is an opportunity to emphasize Jesus' feeling at the very 
depths of abandonment before his final triumph. And my, what a good actor can do, what many have done, with the anguished cry, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Read Mark's passion, then read John's, and tell me that John doesn't present Jesus with a kind of preternatural, kingly serenity. So maybe then, according to the script I had, I played the part just right. Maybe not. Anyway, I was thinking about all of this as I read over St. John's Passion in preparation to preach to you today. You see, I've created a little mental shortcut for myself when I read John's Passion. It leads to two words that I've just said that I first read in a book by New Testament scholar Raymond Brown. Those words are kingly serenity. Jesus has a kingly serenity about him. I still think that's right. But this year, reading these words over again, one short phrase stood out from all the others. It stood out as though the words were somehow floating above the page. Words that betray Jesus' humanity and the depths of his suffering, even if everywhere else he seems remarkably collected. I am thirsty. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. That's John 19, verses 28 and 29. Of course, all the words of Jesus during the Passion, all his words from the cross, all his words, words can and should be read theologically. For theology is faith-seeking understanding of what God is up to in the world, and nowhere have God's purposes been revealed more perfectly than in Jesus. We can and we will read this statement theologically, but park that for just a second. Why do these words stand out in John's narrative? Well, I think precisely because they are so starkly, so unmistakably physical. And that physicality actually tells us something very important about what God is up to in Jesus. Something which we somehow forget as we often treat our religion as a purely spiritual affair or satisfying moral philosophy. And that thing is this. Jesus was fully human. Jesus was fully human and fully divine. That means something so elementary that you may wonder why I'm mentioning it. Because Jesus was fully human, Jesus had a body. He had a normal everyday human body. Why do I mention this? Well, because there's a tendency that we have to forget about this. There's a tendency that we Christians have from time to time to slip into thinking about Jesus that makes him seem on the order of human, but somehow different. After all, he's the one who performed miracles, whose clothes became dazzling white on the Mount of Transfiguration, who walked on the water and rebuked the storm at sea. Yes, he suffered death on the cross for us, but other than that, with access to the power of God, his living must have been quite different from ours. But let me repeat, Jesus was fully human. Jesus had a body. You've got a body. You know what that feels like. Jesus had one too. He was born, he lived, and he died with his own ordinary human body. As an infant, Jesus was as helpless as anyone. I didn't understand fully until I became a parent myself, but my goodness, are babies ever helpless? 
It's enough to occupy your every thought. What do they need? What does that cry mean? Has the fever gone down? And that's in this day and age, in the age of antibiotics and antiseptics and CAT scans and x-rays. Jesus was just as vulnerable as any infant living in the first century, completely vulnerable, completely dependent on his parents to protect him and to provide for him. Like any baby, he needed to be nursed and held and burped and changed. Jesus would have learned to walk and toddled and fallen down and bumped his head. He would have grown up, had growing pains and a voice change and all the awkwardness of teenagehood. Jesus had a body. The Gospels tell us that Jesus got tired, that he slept even in a boat being tossed about by a storm. He had a body. Now, how much have thoughts about our bodies, our own human flesh and all of its vulnerabilities occupied our thoughts for these past years? Even if those thoughts are only running in the background, they're there. You may not think twice about putting your mask on before going somewhere because you've been doing it so long that it's basically muscle memory at this point. But when you put it on, you acknowledge that you have a vulnerable human body. The Lord did too. He got viral and bacterial infections. He coughed, he sneezed, ran a fever, had chills. He experienced everything proper to a human being with a human body, except sin. He got hungry, and here on the cross, he got thirsty. Now perhaps as we look at the empty brass crosses of our churches, or even a crucifix with a rather placid looking corpus upon it, we lose sight of how ghastly a thing crucifixion was, what it did to the human body. It was a mode of execution specifically designed to prolong the agony of the dying person over the course of hours and even days. Consider also Jesus' other physical exertions, being manhandled at his arrest and trial, the torturous scourging, the brutality of carrying his own cross through the streets of Jerusalem to Golgotha, how much fluid he had lost in sweat and blood, and now the exertion of fighting for every breath. Jesus didn't get to take five, have a cool glass of water and sit down. He was exhausted and he was thirsty. When I was in the Holy Land some years ago, we were instructed to drink water constantly. We were counseled that if we hadn't had the urge to urinate after a couple of hours, that we were to drink yet more water and to use the electrolyte tablets that we'd been instructed to bring with us. When we were in the desert, the heat was so oppressive that we would literally run toward any shady spot that we could find. Imagine Jesus' thirst on the cross as he hung there after his long ordeal and in the heat of the Judean sun. Jesus had a body. He was thirsty. Why is that important? The celebrated Methodist preacher, William Willimon, wrote, There's something about us creatures that wants to make Jesus God uncarnate. Here is Jesus, a great spiritual leader, a marvelous teacher of high wisdom, a purveyor of some of the most noble notions ever uttered. If we make him God uncarnate, we can keep him high and lifted up, floating somewhere above the grubby particulates of life. He can mean as much to us as Plato. He can be exclusively spiritual and therefore irrelevant. But for now, Jesus speaks of himself 
I'm thirsty. These words force us to reckon with the reality that Jesus is in the flesh. His suffering is real. The drops of blood, the sweat, the torn flesh, real. Williman goes on to recount a conversation he had on a university campus. Someone saying to him, don't you think it's wonderful that there's so much interest these days on campus in spirituality? His response was, wouldn't know about that. Certainly wouldn't be excited about that. I'm a Christian. We're not spiritual. We're into the physical. Can you say incarnation? Several years ago on Good Friday, Good Friday, I read a passage from a book which contained a detailed description of the crucifixion based on a report published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. More than one person said to me afterwards that they felt they were going to pass out before I finished reading it. The truth was, the truth remains, that I felt very much the same way. See, I didn't read that description with any gratuitous intention. No, I read it because I, like a lot of us, am a spiritual person who needs to be reminded that in my faith, in our faith, God has skin in the game. Another short quotation from Willimon. The Christian faith has got its hands full teaching spiritual people like us that if we're going to meet God, we will meet God in the flesh. Jesus had a body. He was thirsty. Why is that important? James Martin, the Jesuit priest and popular Christian author says, Jesus is having a body is another way that Jesus understands our condition. Jesus understands what we're going through physically, that is. And I share his view. I think that's enormously important. Martin says that there isn't a person alive who doesn't have some physical problem that represents a cross in their lives. It may be relatively small and temporary, like an ingrown toenail, or it may be chronic yet manageable. Maybe you have a much greater cross to bear. You've been diagnosed with a life-threatening disease and you're going through painful treatment for it. As I've said, we all have been living through the stresses and strains, the fears and frustrations of life during a pandemic because we already know the frailty of our bodies. And all of us, each and every one of us, faces the same reality that one day, whether today or many years from now, our bodies will fail us. Or maybe fail is the wrong word. Our bodies will do what all bodies have done since the fall of man. They will cease to function and return to the dust from which they were made. It can be easy to wonder when we're faced with a physical challenge, be it large or small, and when we contemplate our own mortality, whether God is present with us in that challenge, in that contemplation. And I think the answer is simply yes, because in Jesus, God has a body. Notice there I said, has, not had. One of the startling confessions of the Christian religion is that just as Jesus died a real human death, like everyone else has or will in his body, Jesus also rose from the dead in his body, that he ascended into heaven in his body. The risen and ascended Lord still has a body, and that body still bears the wounds of the crucifixion. What does that mean for us? 
It means that Jesus still remembers the pain that he endured on the cross. We say that Jesus died for our sake, and there are many ways in which that is true, but here is one that doesn't get as much airtime as it perhaps deserves. Jesus died for the sake of us who are experiencing physical challenges, and we will all have them, so that we could know that God knows what it is to suffer in our physical bodies. John notes that Jesus said, I am thirsty, not only as a statement of physical reality, but also in order to fulfill the scripture. Though there's no specific reference in the text of the gospel, it's likely that John was thinking of Psalm 69, which includes this passage. Reproach has broken my heart and it cannot be healed. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I could find no one. They gave me gall to eat, and when I was thirsty, they gave me vinegar to drink. That's Psalm 69, verses 22 and 23. As he suffered, Jesus embodied the pain of the people of Israel, that which had been captured in the Psalms. Jesus was suffering for the sin of Israel, even as he was taking upon himself the sin of the world. And here's where a biblical reading, a theological reading of our Lord's thirst is helpful. This is not the first time that we have heard the word thirst on Jesus's lips. In the biblical imagination, thirst is a vivid word that usually means to desire from the deepest parts of ourselves. That's what Jesus had in mind in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, when he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The psalmist sings, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. We all know what it's like to be thirsty. But let me ask you, what's the thirstiest you've ever been? I can remember vividly the thirstiest I ever was. It wasn't in the Judean wilderness or the Sinai Desert or Death Valley or the Everglades or the Grand Canyon, though I've spent many thirsty hours in all of those places. No, it was in the middle of a sweaty rock concert, a club called the Opera House in Toronto. I'd staked out a spot right up front at the barricade because I was so excited to see my favorite band at the time, and they were the fourth band on a five band bill and I stood squashed up against that barricade for hours jostled around by the mosh pit behind me at some points clinging to the barricade to keep from being pulled back away from my prime spot and finally my favorite band played and I was right up front and I sang my heart out to every song until about halfway through their set when I began to feel lightheaded and my vision started to get black around the edges and I realized that I was about to faint if I didn't get a drink of water right now. I looked toward the bar and saw that it was so crowded with customers that I had no hope of getting a drink there in time. So in an instant, I decided to leave. It didn't matter that I was missing my favorite band, that my friends were going to wonder where I was. I walked out of the club past the bouncer who grunted at me, no ins and outs, meaning I couldn't go back in after I'd left. At that point, I didn't care. And I crossed Queen Street, did I check for traffic? I can't remember, and went directly to the convenience store across the street. I grabbed a one liter bottle of water and drank it down entirely, waving away the proprietor who had begun yelling at me, you pay first, you pay first. I grabbed another bottle and took both to the cash and paid for them. And I went outside and sat down on the sidewalk and sipped the second bottle of water and felt myself slowly, slowly coming back into full possession of my faculties. Now, I've told you that whole story because I think the last part of it is great. Do you want to know the name of the band that I was so excited to see that day? H2O. I kid you not. Now, think of the thirstiest you've ever been. Jesus blessed people who were that thirsty, as thirsty as they've ever been, 
for righteousness. People who were that thirsty for building up the kingdom, that thirsty for seeing the world grow up into the full stature of Christ, not caring anymore for their own preferences and priorities, but consumed with a single-minded purpose to establish God's reign of justice and peace. Jesus thirsted on the cross. Now think of your own thirst. Your thirst for communion with your Lord. Your thirst for Jesus. Does your soul yearn for the living water that Jesus supplies? And does your thirst mirror God's own thirst? For what has God shown us that he's up to in the Christ who cried from the cross that he was thirsty? That God is possessed by an overwhelming thirst for our flourishing in the light of his love. Here on the cross, Jesus cries that he is thirsty. They gave him vinegar on a stick to drink. But previously, Jesus had asked his disciples, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Isn't it possible that as his mission neared its completion, as he dug deep to endure the last of the agonies of his passion, Jesus cried out that he was thirsty to drink the cup that only he could drink, the cup of God's wrath that rightly should be ours to drink, but which he drank to the dregs. In John's gospel, so full of I am's, was this not Jesus's last word during his earthly life on what God was up to in him? I am thirsty for this cup of wrath. I will drink it for you, that you may thirst instead for righteousness, that you may drink the water springing up to eternal life. Far from kingly serenity, this is a call from the very heart of God meant to reach deep into our own hearts to that place that causes us to act with purest intention. Jesus calls from the cross that he is thirsty. He is thirsty for our sake, that we might thirst for his kingdom and his righteousness. My friends, on this day of the cross, we are meant to consider all that Jesus' sacrifice means for us and for the world. It is an event so saturated in meaning that we might well ponder the last word in John's gospel that if every one of the things Jesus did were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Even a very long sermon can't come close to being comprehensive. And thank God, for in Jesus there are wonders beyond imagining. And still it is God's good gift to us in Christ to make his purposes for the whole creation known. In Jesus, God has taken our frail flesh, our hungering, thirsting flesh, and died for us. And in the act of dying on a cruel cross, declared his thirst for us, that we might thirst after him and his kingdom. And God bless you. Amen.
from his blessed throne, salvation to his door, but all made strange and none the longed for Christ would know, but all oh, my friend, my friend indeed, who at my need his life did send. Sometimes they stood people of God, our Heavenly Father, sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. Let us humbly come before the Lord our God. Let us pray for the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops, priests, deacons, religious and other ministers, and the people whom they serve, for our bishops, Andrew, Rusilla, and Kevin, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized and confirmed and ordained, that the Lord will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by your spirit, the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in our vocation and ministry, we may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For Elizabeth, our queen, and all the royal family, for Justin, the prime minister, and for the government of this country, for Doug, the premier of this province and the members of the legislature, for Bob, the mayor of this municipality, and those who serve with him on the town council. For first responders, health care, child care, and social workers, and all who serve the common good. That by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution or prejudice, for the sick, the wounded, and the disabled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, hear the cry of those in misery and need. In their afflictions, show them your mercy and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for all those who suffer the consequences of the current pandemic, that God the Father may grant health to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to families, and salvation for all who have died. Almighty, ever-living God, only support of our human weakness, look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer because of this pandemic. Relieve the pain of the sick. Give strength to those who care for them. Welcome into your house those who have died, and throughout this time of tribulation, grant that we may all find comfort in your merciful love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for all who have not heard the words of salvation, for all who have lost their faith, for all whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ, for all who actively oppose Christ by word or deed, for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ, and persecutors of his disciples. For all who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray. That there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this life and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord, 
and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly recalled the death of your Son in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Grant us pardon. Bring us comfort. May our faith grow stronger and our eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.